So let's do some poetry. Um, I know that part of you, maybe most of you, are here to listen to poetry. The other part are here to support CRF, and because your spouse said you had to come. So we're going to start with the poetry and make everybody happy. Okay, so we're going to get done. So we have local poets. Uh, we got Bill from Bill Barak from around the corner that way. Uh, we got Lois Hollow from around the corner this way, I think. Me, I'm around the corner that way. And we let a couple of people from Bellingham sneak in, uh, Judy Kleinberg and uh, Kevin Murphy. So that's the array, and plus we're gonna let Tim read a couple things, I think, at the end, so. Okay, so um, I asked each of the poets for three words that I could introduce themselves with, because I didn't want to go on and on about all our degrees in poetry and all the books we published and all that stuff. And so, um, so I finally got Kevin to, Kevin Murphy, who's was gonna be our first reader to respond. And his first three words were, whimsical, subversive, and offbeat, which works pretty well, except that he, he caught me in the parking lot and said, I think, he, I think basically he suddenly realized tomorrow was Sunday. He says, I want to change my three words to good Catholic boy. <laughs> so Kevin Murphy. Catholic meat uh, can be, uh, it means universal, actually. And uh, I always, you know, when I uh, am introduced or referred to as a local poet, I think, well, if I were a local poet, I wouldn't get lost as often. I'd be better on giving directions. So, so I think, you know, actually, I'm, I'm kind of a universal poet. <laughs> Never believe what a book says about a tree Because books are made of dead trees And the dead are jealous of the living And do not describe them objectively Geology are more reliable. Although the origins of the ink create cause for concern. <laughs> Thanks. This is a kind of a magical music stand here. Magnetic, maybe? OK. This uh, next poem has an epigraph uh, from William Carlos Williams. Unworldly love that has no hope of the world and that cannot change the world to its delight. The man who fell in love with a tree. A man falls in love with a tree a crabapple tree in his backyard, and can think of no other. Enthralled by its unique tangle of twigs and branches, elated by its leafly murmurations, he tells the tree of his feelings. The crabapple tree is flattered, but noncommittal. The man is not discouraged. The man who falls in love with the tree is no fool. He knows issues will come up. Age issues, the tree is twice as old as he is. Height issues, the tree is 20 feet taller than he is. <laughs> to say nothing of religion or the man's family's likely reaction. The man wants to run away with the tree, but the tree remains firmly rooted. The tree says that for his idea to progress, the man would have to become a tree. The man is open to this. <laughs> A man vows to become a tree, if not in this lifetime, then in the next. 
He reads up on photosynthesis, osmosis, mythology. He watches instructional videos, prepares the necessary paperwork. <laughs> Other trees say, you're overthinking this. It all comes down to practice. The man practices. He digs his toes into the dirt, strikes a tree-like pose. A sparrow lands on his wrist. His friends don't, see, don't get what he sees in the tree. It's just a scraggly old backyard crab apple. Its fruit is not forbidden so much as inedible. <laughs> the tree is an ordinary tree, yes, but in it, the man sees other trees. When he tells the tree, you are every tree in the world to me, it's true. Mesmerized by the crab apple, he sees forms, he sees beyond it. He sees a madrona twisting on a cliff above the sea, a sequoia scraping the clouds, a banyan tree festooned with ribbons and circled by dancing villagers. He sees trees of Africa and Alaska, trees full of marmosets and mangoes and macaws. The man stands next to the tree and gnarls his limbs, can almost feel tiny buds pushing out his fingertips. The tree says, you're standing too close. <laughs> Once there was a man who fell in love with a tree, who decided that he did not need his human life, but would rather be a tree. He tilts toward the rising sun, inhales the light, and is satisfied. On his shaded side, a pale moss is sprouting. He knows it is difficult, this love, but he believes he can make it work. They can make it work. The tree is flattered, but non-committal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this one is called My Extended Family. My extended family transcends barriers of species, phyla, order, and class, sprawls across genomes, kingdoms, and continents. My extended family comprises not only every one of the multitudinous Murphys of Ireland, not only the entire, entire sprawling clan of latter-day Gothic affiliates on my maternal side, but all humanoids without regard to race, creed, or socioeconomic status, horse thieves, drunkards, and scoundrels of every stripe, apes both illiterate and erudite, toads, hyenas, jackals, and vultures, sea slugs and ponderosa pines, wolf lichen and thimble berries. My extended family includes all 1,500 species of rodent, 350,000 different kinds of beetles, 20,000 varieties of flatworm, the spores of extraterrestrial slime mold, and all 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives. <laughs> Long lost cousins chortle in the shrubbery or hang screeching in caves. Impromptu family reunions occur at murky river bottoms where the catfish are uncles, the eels are aunties, and the river itself is the great, great grandmother. My extended family is bioluminescent, straddles the mineral microbial divide. We gyrate under microscopes and gnaw the bones of dead sheep by candlelight. We are atomically unstable, emotionally volatile, and prone to interminable meltdowns. In other words, the classic nuclear family. <laughs> but whatever our issues, my extended family has always been a close family, intimate if unconsciously so, bound by a profound, almost cellular mutual affection, embracing with the desperation of those who have run out of other options. Co-conspirators in the same tenuous project, sometimes known as life on Earth. <laughs> Thanks, and, and just one more, which is really an, an excerpt from a poem that I wrote called Discovery Bay. 
Uh, for years, I lived in a cabin in uh, Discovery Bay outside of uh, Port Townsend. Maybe you know the cabin. Uh, right next door to Jerry Gorslin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it had no electricity or, or running water or anything. And, uh, and so as I say, this is kind of an excerpt from that poem. Um, the roof needs fixing over the stove. And when the rain picks up, the steady drip, sizzle drip, drives me crazy. I go out to the porch to listen to the other sounds. 10,000 windy waterfalls making a song of everything. Snails, clams, mussels, murmuring strange and shady incantations, their voices made of salt. Cedars and alders whispering to each other from that place where there is no each and there is no other. Yeah, thankfully, I don't have to follow Kevin, so it's good. <laughs> Wondrous. Uh, first of all, how's the sound in the back? Are we okay? Okay, very good. Go in the back. <laughs> Wondrous, semi-permeable, non-equilibrium. Bill Brock. Yeah, thanks a lot, Luther. I get to follow Kevin. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here in support of CRF. Thank you to the organizers, to the hall, to the poets, and to all of you that we may share our concern and our grief and our joy to live on this beautiful planet. And praise, of course, to trees, lovers of trees, protectors of trees, poet trees, <laughs> praise to trees. I'd like to share a poem written in celebration of the coming of spring. I thought, I thought it would be appropriate today because I think in spring, Many um, miracles are poised to occur. And whenever people gather in love and in knowledge and in commitment, then here I think miracles are poised. This is a prose poem. It's called a love poem. It's a little bit of a journey, so come on along. <laughs> Circumambulating the watershed, walking the ridgeline, looking in and down the deep green drainages, across the broad forested hills, down where the river and its bar meander, there and there, there, all around. Miracles are poised like clouds heavy with rain like swollen buds yearning to open. Miracles are poised in the lengthening days of strengthening sun, and deep down in the fecund richness, miracles are stirring again and again. From the same ridgeline, this time looking out, I see this watershed is a whole, but also a part of a greater whole, which is all likewise a part of a greater whole, which is likewise a part, etc., etc., until eventually the greatest whole, whole we can hold in our mind comes up to the ridge line between the one big watershed and the edge of something utterly unthinkable and certainly unspeakable, except to say it is endlessly opening a gaping mouth ready to swallow even the fear you will be gone, and as sudden as that, in the instant of a thought arising, 
in the infinitesimally small attachment, the desire of vapor for dust, you fall from the sky, a raindrop, and the gravity of the earth is the pull of the known, is the poignant transiency, the immaculate flowering of this and that and you and me and we are back just like that, spring again in a mature forest. The raindrop falls onto licorice fern, perched in the crotch of a high branch in a giant big leaf maple. The rain drip drops through a luxurious mound of moss and out again to open air, catching light as it falls to soil surface, seeping in, seeping in, and suddenly sucked up in the straw of a root, up through thin cambial well of stacked xylem cells, passing up and up and up and out through thin twigs, becoming moisture in the swollen leaf bud swaying, in the canopy unfurling, in the swirling fragrance of forest air, and being breathed out through leaf pour. <sighs> we leap with abandon into April's, or perhaps August's, impetus. We're up and up again. We are drawn to becoming the gracious condensate of clouds, the invisible become visible, vapor condensed, gathered and layered and swirled across the open sky, and this is just one way. This is just one of the ways that we who are being sometimes appear and move around and nurture each other and create beauty and transform ourselves into sparkling dewdrops in the moonlight or misty teardrops in our eyes at night as we lie looking up to the wondrous empty sky full of stars and the earth at our back. And just one more very short one. This is called Gathering Attention from Ming Hao Zhan, favorite eighth century rivers and mountains Chinese poet. Gathering attention, depths of mind entered, energies arise, subtle and subtler still. Ideas of things fall away, concepts crumble in tangled heaps. When understanding enters, other cannot be found. Holding attachments lightly, the way winds ahead, in and out of sight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Conifer, thesaurus, invisibility. Judy Kleinberg. Let's see here. Hello. Um, hey, maybe that'll work. Okay, that's good. Nice to see you all. I'm going to um, start with a poem out of this amazing collection from the Madrona Project. It is a collection of all uh, written material and art about trees. And if you're into trees, this is a fine addition to your library. And you will recognize that my poem is not local, but it is true. It's called Eucalyptus. My father set the young eucalyptus trees in their five-gallon cans along an unfenced line that divided our backyard from the neighbors. The 25 saplings were skinny, a little shaggy, and taller than my father, the cans heavy with soil and water as he adjusted their spacing. The ground was rough and weedy and sloped, unfriendly to shovel and knees, but over the weeks, the holes were dug and the trees settled on the hillside. 
I was six or seven at the time, and my job was to snake the long hose down the hill to water the young trees. When the patio cracked down the middle, I had learned the word erosion, the trees now part of a bulwark to keep our house from sliding into the cemetery at the bottom of the hill. For a while, the trees were an attraction. Neighbors came to look, and guests were invited to admire the feathery boughs and my father's hard work. Though I never tired of collecting the woody nuts, the trees were messy in their habits. The least breeze loosing a shower of long, pungent leaves, bark, and branches. Some years, our neighbor Joaquin would come to the door to say his tortoise had wandered, and we would walk together down the railroad tie steps my father had placed near the trees. We searched, pulling aside a scruff of eucalyptus debris, and in due time would find a tortoise-sized excavation near the base of one tree or another, and inside it, the drowsing tortoise, who would be eased out and returned to her life of green lawns and fresh lettuce. When the trees and my father had reached a venerable age, he spoke of visiting the farm in Ohio, where he had lived for a while as a child. Some of the neighbors and their children and grandchildren still lived in the same houses, had never left, rooted to the place like the maple trees his father had planted in the farm's yard. Two people, he said, couldn't reach their arms around the massive trunks. Measured on the scale of his own life, nature's work seemed far more impressive than the achievements of his peers at the 50-year college reunion he attended on the same trip. He had planted trees, tended them, carved them with chisel and mallet, had respected their strength and vulnerability. They were reliable and unemotional as he strived to be. But after this trip, my father revisited the eucalyptus trees one by one, navigated the unsteady footing of the hillside, pressed his hands against their bark, their great girth, in a greeting of old friends who shared hard memories and laughter, who could admit their excesses and frailties, could see mirrored in each other's aging flesh their own astonishing beauty, ever-changing, generous, without vanity or greed or complaint. So this is a little change of direction, but it's from the same time, and this is actually a, a prose piece, and it is called Loquat. Below the retaining wall that held our back slope in place, my father leveled a narrow terrace where, at my mother's urging, he planted a trio of small trees. One was an exotic flowering shrub of some sort that never produced flowers. The second was an orange tree that burst into intoxicating bloom each year. Its fragrance would waft up the hill and into the house. The blossoms transformed themselves into fruit as round and green as peas and then fall off. It never yielded an orange larger than a hazelnut. Perhaps it was the slope or the soil or the oily fallout of the adjacent row of eucalyptus, but neither of the trees could deliver on their promise. With my mother standing at the edge of the patio offering suggestions from above, my father tried ministrations of every sort to no avail. After that, each year, my mother invested all of her hope in the third tree, a loquat. This robust individual could do nothing but bear fruit. I was oblivious to its progress, but at some point my mother would start issuing daily instructions for me to descend the hill and check the loquats. This I did by giving the fruit 
a few little squeezes, and bringing back a promising sample for her to examine. I'm not sure what she had in mind. She certainly never made jam, but these were labor-intensive fruits, about the size of a walnut, but pear-like in shape. They had tough, slightly furred skin, three or four or five large, slimy, glossy brown seeds, and in between the skin and the seeds, perhaps an eighth of an inch of flesh that was an astringent cross between an apricot and a pear. At any rate, one day the sample I brought up would prove suitable, and my mother would set out a large basket for the next morning's harvest. There were hundreds of loquats on the tree. The following morning, as directed, I would carry the basket down the steps and across the terrace, and without fail, the tree would be stripped bare, the birds having arisen at dawn to, conf <laughs> to confirm Dorothy's assessment of ripeness and not paused as I had for breakfast cereal. <laughs> A scattering of seeds and shriveled, pecked fruits was all that remained. This scenario was repeated annually for perhaps five years until Dorothy gave up and the loquat tree became sort of a family shorthand for abundant riches that never quite made it to the bank. <laughs> So, I think this will work, yes? My three words are um, aging, cranky, and almost retired. <laughs> I'm going to start with a couple of poems um, from my book, uh, The View from Lummi Island. Clear cut, there was something here, intact, integral, binding, held. A slow dynamic of exchange, beautifully performed. Then a piecemeal studied obliteration, like watching one's children felled before one's eyes, leaving only ruts shatter debris, like going home and finding rubble, severed body parts. There was something here, and now it is gone, trucked away. The old second growth of firs and cedars, royal and scatter, orchestrate the restless oceans of air passing through over this island, never to be the same. And I want to read an excerpt from a longer poem called Late Blacktail Season. Uh, two or three years ago, I, uh, during hunting season, I drove out the dike, which is right there, right? Um, Hadn't been up there for 20 years, probably. And it's all, those of you who don't know, it's all commercial forest land, which I basically support. I think we need lumber, and I think it's not a horrible way to, uh, uh, to go about business, but I think there's a lot of practices that need to be improved. So, out of that. Um, I start, and this is as I was driving along, I start to feel a profound and unyielding dis-ease the power of what's been lost here. The stripped rawness, a dark chill, felt despite the cocoon of the cab. The last rain sits on the ground, lost. The impenetrable second or third growth firs, the lifeless shadows, the gray devastation, the chaos of new cuts, everything managed, mismanaged. The taste of bile, of spilled diesel, of a battered emptiness, the entry to an apocalypse. Mm -hmm. 
So um, this poem uh, starts out, it's all personal experience, basically. It starts out in the southwest and winds up in the northwest. Um, trees, memoir, elegies. Forests are not a collection of trees, rather a slowly morphing community of beings, a network of processes. Nothing has an independent existence, even us. A kid climbing Chinese elms in the South Valley, Albuquerque. The young animal in me just wants to know, clinging to the fissured bark, the fear and love of being held aloft. Our family sold Christmas trees on the front lawn, taken from the family ranch. I was good at finding them, like the feel of the saw, sure, clean, in dominion. Fifty innocent furs packed in the bed of the Jeep. Two weeks of sparkle, then the dump. I watched my cowboy uncle back his truck over a young spruce, like it wasn't there. Wrong. In the heart. What is this thing we call a tree? Does it matter? Maybe twelve? Splitting big ponderosa rounds for firewood, I loved the violence, the thwunk of the axe, the clean uncoupling, the exposure of the hidden, the never before seen. That first winter in Velarde, the only firewood, the bare twisted cottonwood, knotted stubborn fibers, the only saw, a dull Swedish bow saw, the only axe used as a wedge went through three handles, learned stubborn. <laughs> we are what we do, what we touch, what touches us, what we remember. We built the house on Summit Ridge with milled logs, long spikes, sledgehammers, fitting tongues to grooves, former tree to former tree, to sleep in that nest. The first driving rain, a slobbering waterfall on the inside. <laughs> Didn't work. <clears throat> Caught in the late fall windstorm in Colorado, the crack and crash of flying limbs, I see 20 tall aspens fall, the thwump as each one explodes into the ground. To be killed by a tree. At first, I was afraid. Pinion, juniper, scrub oak, Ponderosa pine, aspen. <clears throat> I moved through them. My bones were their bones. There is no need for prayer. Bodai, Dangsang Namu, Abraham's Oak, Shinboku, Baobao, Yggdrasil. Years later, I learned to feel the energy of a tree from 20 feet away, to feel the flow beneath the bark to feel the roots with my feet, learned, opened. The aging animal in me just wants to know, what is this thing we call a tree? What is this thing we call the earth? What is this thing we call a mind? On the west slope of the Cascades, the big cedars are dying, suffocated by the heat. I had seven taken down yesterday. Landscaping, years of firewood, less oxygen, more smoke. It could all come to this. There is my name, and there is the name of the tree. And then there are no words at all. Thank you. This is perfect. Grateful sensory human, Lois Holub. I am just feeling spellbound by these um, amazing pictures that are coming through words. 
and I want to offer out. I want to offer this energy that is being made here. Offer it out to the world to do something good for the trees. It's pretty powerful stuff, and I'm really honored to be here in such incredible company. Thank you, poets.、Um, <clears throat> So this poem is called "Die Like a Tree." After she died, we piled my mother's body with all the things she might want in the spirit world: crossword puzzles, photos, a book, tea bags, her favorite slippers, so they would turn to ash with her body and join her on the other side. Cremation after death is a thing in my family. Generations placed in humble urns atop mantles, sealed in pockets of marble columbarium, or simply scattered to the winds at sea. But lately, I feel a wish, deep as physical longing, to know I could die like a tree dies. A tree who dies in their deep forest gets to stay. In their forest, still belongs to the forest, continues to be part of all that life, even in death. So instead of scattered ashes in every favorite place, my body could be set down in a forest somewhere, far off any trail, under cedar trees and hemlock and all kinds of maple. Moths could kiss my eyelashes. Mushrooms blossom on my skin. The ground could say hello to every cell, and the ravens could make what I was grow wings and fly. And after the ravens are done, let the worms and beetles take the rest deeper into the forest floor, under leaves and needles, down under the duff, down into the dark. So what carried me. For so many years, can rise free into green fern, into elderberry, so what I traveled in for so many years can finally travel light through the roots of a growing cedar into a new tree ring of time. This one is called "How I Saved the World," and it starts with three quotes from others. The first one is from John Donne: "No man is an island." A Ukrainian traditional saying: "The earth is a woman, and she will rise." And from Ursula K. Le Guin: "The word for world is forest." It was the earliest I'd been in the woods, maybe ever. Too many scorching days in a row, and too hot to sleep before 3 a.m. I still managed to get up and out a mere hour past sunrise. The trailhead offered shade, while the sun filtered down in warm shadows and cool light. As I walked, I started to notice my breath. Sometimes, even though I'm in the forest to forget the words. My thoughts keep pace with my footsteps. I talk to world leaders, demanding climate action and accountability. I tell radio callers which books to read next. I exhort the guy down valley with the NRA sign and Confederate flags covering his windows to, for God's sake, change the channel. I tell Ukraine, I'm trying. I tell Rachel Maddow and the ghost of Mary Oliver, "I'm trying." I tell school teachers and doctors without borders, "I'm trying." I tell my small grandsons and my garden and my own conscience, "I'm trying." In my head, I'm trying to figure out how to save the world. This morning, when I realized, after passing the ancient cedar sentry around the second curve of the long trail, that I was still in my head and not in the moment, I stopped. I mean, I stopped walking. I stopped thinking and trying and deliberating the most effective language and just stood there, 
in the woods, breathing. And everything came alive. I mean, everything I breathed in was living. The hidden songs of the thrush and the wren, the call of the bullfrog and chatter of chipmunk, the silence of the ferns. I inhaled the breath of the ancestors, taken in and released again by these very trees. I inhaled the past and exhaled the present right into the future. The longer I stood there, still and listening, the deeper each breath became, warmed by morning light, cooled by dragonfly wings over the pond, like a taste of tenderness. And in that short eternity, in those still precious moments, with all my senses alive, I was not a man, I was not an island, I wasn't even a woman. I was the whole world, and I was saving myself. Tim McNulty is a poet, nature writer, and conservation activist. His essays and articles on forests, wildlife, and wilderness have appeared in numerous anthologies and journals, and his natural history writings have been translated into German, Chinese, and Japanese. Tim's poetry books include Ascendance, In Blue Mountain Dusk, and Paw Tracks, among others. He is the author of 11 books of natural history, including Olympic National Park, a natural history winner of the Nat Washington State Book Award and Washington's Mount Rainier National Park, which won the National Outdoor Book Award. He is the author of Washington's Wild Rivers, The Unfinished Work, and co-author of The Enduring Forests. Tim is vice president of the Olympic Park Advocates, a grassroots conservation organization that focuses on the Olympic ecosystem. He lives with his wife, Mary, in the foothills of the Dungeness River country. Now, I was going to introduce him as the um, elder statesman of Northwestern nature writing, but he's not that old. So. <laughs> Tim McNulty, we're honored to have you here. Uh, to these incredible family of poets we've been listening to. Yeah. Oh my gosh, what a, wow, a forest burial. <laughs> what a poem. Um, well, I had, uh, let's see, uh, I had the good luck, the, the dumb luck of, of landing as a young man um, in a place, uh, the Olympic Peninsula. Um, I was, Drawn there, Let's see if I can move this up a little. Is that good? Good, yeah. I was drawn there by the mountains and, and uh, the rivers, um, the wild coastline, and of course the incredible range of, of uh, forests on the peninsula. And um, I was looking for some inspiration. I wanted to be in a place that inspired me to maybe write some poems, see what happens. So, uh, kind of, uh, I guess maybe. Uh, I am kind of that old, so I'm sort of on the other end of that. That was over 50 years ago now, and, and I'm, I'm still grateful for, for uh, you know, for, for, for that stroke of, of luck, that, that good chance that, that connected me with that place. Um, uh, gee, also wanted to thank Brel for the invitation, and Elizabeth, um, Jillian, uh, this is an incredible uh, afternoon, evening you've put together here. You're doing such great work. And I'm honored to be, uh, to be asked to be part of that. Um, so I thought I'd just, uh, just to kind of, I wanted to give you a sense of, of um, the kind of logging that was, that was going on on the Olympic Peninsula then. And then I won't, I won't harp on this anymore, but in the, in the mid-70s, mid uh, from all ownerships, Forest Service, State, DNR lands, 
extensive privately owned forest lands. There were just a little under two billion uh, board feet a year being being logged off the Olympic Peninsula. A lot of that was being exported. For those of you who don't think in terms of multiple millions of board feet, <laughs> full log trucks from the from the U.S. border at Blaine down to Mexico, down I-5, bumper to bumper, that's one billion board feet. So um, the place was being treated badly, and and uh, I, you know, I kind of just got kicked in the ass to try to to try to work for trying to save some of these places that were inspiring me so much. So um, uh, here's some poems from along the way. This first one, um, Meditation Above Ozette, uh, I like it because it's, it's one of the, um, the first poems where my, my approach and, you know, I was working as a, as a tree planter in my early years on the peninsula and, and so getting a chef's tour of some of the most abused landscapes um, anywhere both on the peninsula and throughout the Northwest. And at this point I was in about a, a, a 200 acre clear cut. We were working there for what seemed like weeks, it was a long time, February, rain. And after work, I would um, uh, take a walk up on a ridge where I could look down into the basin, at that time, largely uncut basin of Lake Ozette out on the coast of the Olympic Peninsula. And beyond that, the little rise of land separating Ozette from the, from, from the ocean and then the Pacific, and I'd hang out there for the, for the sunrise. I always carried a little notebook in my pocket Tree tallies mostly back then, but I'd also try to capture some images. That was my, that was my goal to try to see if I could evoke in language some of the experiences I was having. So, so this one, um, this one kind of worked pretty well. It's called Meditation Above Ozette. From the swamplands down in the draw, all the frogs you could ever hope to know are singing to each other. For miles, the low hills bow deeply to the lake, who holds now the passing shadows of clouds as one holds a promise. East, the ridges still deep in snow are glowing some, and beyond them, the last ragged patterns of geese have disappeared, laughing their curious laugh against the night. I try this poem once for measure, no one but the wind. Um, and that little closing, that little closing uh, image was, um, if it felt like I was trying to sort of, the place was I, was, I was clicking on all cylinders, I'd sometimes read aloud, you know. And, uh, and I did, and, and uh, a little gust of wind was all that was left after that. So um, I, I jumped into um, trying to, uh, back then our, our, our our, our options for trying to preserve forests were pretty limited. On national forest land, it was pretty much de designation of wilderness areas, and it was Congress that had to do that back in D.C. It made it a very elaborate and long and, and uh, 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 involved campaign, but it also was able to conscript congressmen and senators from the rest of the country who sometimes weren't that crazy about what was happening to national forests in the West. So um, this is a poem called Where All the Marmots from Marmot Pass Went To. And uh, if you're and even familiar with the Olympics, Marmot Pass is an incredible high mountain pass in the Eastern Olympics. Back then, it was open to motorbikes. Um, hunters were going up there on dirt bikes. They're taking pot shots at marmots because marmots are the sentries of the high country. And their shrill whistle when there's danger around um, was, was really, uh, you know, warning everybody, so they were easy targets. Where all the marmots from Marmot Pass went to? On the high barren ridge, Welsh rocks north to the call, not a whistle. Steep timbered slopes dropped to the far song of a creek. Ridge crest trailed into ridge crest. Over a thin mantle of soil, bobcat track, motorbike track. The spur roads press like blind roots up the valleys, abandon, slide, and wash into watersheds from a desk map in a distant town. These are the ribs and fingers of earth, rippling strata of upturned sea bottom, mountains how many times before, 
Basalt cooled beneath ancient waves, limestone body of sleeping mollusk and snail, all lifted and worn in a slow, ceaseless pulse, contained somehow. A cool, sunny autumn wind rustles through lupin and dock. From the south, over Constance, the first flecks of cirrus. Back beneath the asphalt, the parked tractors and stacked logs, the ghosts of all the marmots are gnawing at the roots of things. Whole hillsides full of stumps are getting restless. Wolf spirits, bear spirits can't find work. And all through the cities and freeways and banks, these faint, high-pitched whistles that don't seem to come from outside. So that was a, a little, um, hey, right here. Um, I collaborated with uh, a, a lot of friends on, on some of those early wilderness campaigns. One was a, a, a photographer named Stephen Johnson, and uh, he did black and white photography. And I'd go out with him, I'd, I'd take notes and try to write poems and little prose snatches of some of the areas we were trying to preserve he would very patiently wait for the right light. And, uh, you know, he was really instrumental in teaching me that when you want to write a poem about a place, you need to go there and sit and, you know, wait and don't push it. So this is called Cloud Studies, and it comes from the Gray Wolf River Valley, in the, um, which is very close to where I live right now. On a small shale ledge over the Gray Wolf, poised with tripod and lens, half the day in the rain. It takes time to see, you say. Five years with clouds is nothing. A ridgeline softens and drifts up valley. Small breaths lift from an empty ravine, curve against contours, pillow and swale. Or the wavering finger dance of mists caught on an updraft, strained through crooked silver snags. Higher, the clouds ebb and break along narrow cliffs of polished bone, Eocene flow, the long, slow sift of river stone far below. Maybe ten years is a start. A hemlock bough lifts and settles, the maple leaf tips, 20 miles of rain. Um, so that's a, um, a couple of those uh, poems from my, um, my first book, Pawtracks, when I was kind of, you know, um, trying to figure out how to write poetry, trying to save trees all at the same time. <laughs> still trying, still trying to do both, in fact. Um, and this is a, a poem from I, when I um, hiked out from my cabin to go to work every day. It's called A Poet's Job. In the early spring morning frost, two deer browse the huckleberry shoots from Crown Zellerback's holding over into Scott paper. <laughs> a poet's job is a tricky one. <laughs> um, and, and it is. <laughs> So, um, I think, yeah, let's do this. This is a little prose piece. It's called Coyote at the Movies. Now, I haven't read this in a long time, but I see a couple of you might have remembered it. Um, and the idea here is, is there's a forestry promotional film that, uh, you know, shows why forests have to be cut and turned into suburbs, and, and Coyote finds a copy of it. And he, <laughs> he invites all his animal friends to... Come and see it, he spins it backwards. We've all seen it before, Warehouser, Georgia Pacific, Simpson Timber, Crown Z, the same forestry promo film, rundown of the industry from forest tree to suburb box. But when Coyote got hold of the lost film can and took a look at the end of the reel, he knew immediately how to run it and invited all his friends. So the finished tracked houses and tormented lawns and shrubs that so upset and displaced all the animals there became the beginning. 
Here we are, said Coyote, and all agreed. But suddenly there appeared a whole crew of human workers who carefully and quickly began taking the houses down, <laughs> shingle by board, by window, by door, and loaded the pieces into large flat trucks. In a flash, the trucks had delivered the lumber to a great lodge. Coyote told them was the lodge of many healing wheels. Told them he'd been there himself at night and seen it all. Inside, the great wheels with teeth sharper than beavers spin all the boards back into logs again. No one had ever seen anything like this. And even Coyote was taken aback at the sight. In awe, they watched the logs be carried by huge machines larger than elephants and loaded onto long trucks, which, driving backward so the trees could steer them through many small towns, far into the mountains on special roads built just for them. <laughs> it was such a wonderful sight, even the old man himself had to smile, all those old trees going back home. Once there, there were huge towers as high as a Douglas fir that carefully lowered the logs down to just their precise spots on the hillside. The squirrels were beside themselves. <laughs> but who are these blue-shirted workmen who wait in the brush? Coyote says they are shaman who possess magic wands of smoke. And if everyone watched closely, they would see them placing all the limbs and branches back onto the broken trees. Amazing, they were even, join, even joining and healing the cut trunks back together. Everyone agreed these must be powerful priests and marveled at the special herbs they kept in small tins in their pockets <laughs> and kept adding to endlessly from behind their lips. <laughs> they all work for me, Coyote said, but no one was listening. Instead, they were watching the shaman wave their wands over the stumps and the trees would leap into the air amid great clouds of needles and dust and noise. Everyone ducked, and when they looked again, the trees sat majestically back on their stumps unscratched. Now there were such great cheers from the crowd <laughs> that Rabbit had to place his forepaws into his ears and Mole hurriedly dug his way underground. Coyote, he decided right then and there that that was just the way he was going to work things and that he was going to start the very next day. Even if it takes a while, he thought out loud. Yes, even if it takes a good long time. So, Mr. Coyote. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't taken Coyote out for a spin in a while. It feels pretty good anymore. Um, this is a poem uh, called The Queets. It's from, uh, um, I think I'll read a couple of uh, poems working on, on the trails after oh, a near decade of, of um, you know, uh, seasonal working in, in the uh, clear cuts. I, I need to get back into some real woods. And so I signed on with the Olympic National Park Trail crew and put in several seasons there. Um, and this is from that time, the Queets. We worked through dinner on a windfall spruce above Pelton Creek, a tree thick as we were tall. Wedging our cuts, edging PV and shim, wheel after slow turning wheel to near dark. Smoothed out the trail tread, packed our tools and started back seven miles down river to camp. Past Bob Creek, the last light was loosening itself from the grass, falling from the moss shoulders of maple and alder. A doe and her yearling browsed the far river bank, and somewhere nearby a flicker tapped randomly. The river carried with it its own light and coursed slowly through the late summer bottom. The tools lay in a pile where I'd dropped them at the trail side. My partner hadn't yet caught up. All I knew at the worn and frazzled end of that long day was the last light slipping from us, the chill air trothing down dark timbered slopes, and the lucent voice of the river telling me it no longer mattered. Um, thank you. 
Thank you. Um, one more, I think one more trail crew poem. And this is called Autumn Equinox, uh, which was uh, my wife's and I anniversary. And as I, uh, as I recall, this was, um, this was our second anniversary, and it was the second anniversary I missed being working up in the mountains. So I thought I needed to do something, so I tried this. Autumn Equinox. <laughs> Above the river, high on a springy limb, a squirrel is cutting green cones, and hard little thunks echo through the trees. It's equinox, our anniversary, and again, I'm working away from home. Late morning, sunny, not cold, but not quite warm, as I shape a fir log for a bridge stringer five miles up the sole duck trail. Rough bark curls over the draw knife. White chips jump from the ax bit and tumble down the hillside while a soft rain of straw dry needles filters through long shafts of light. The second year now I've been off working on this day, midpoint in the year's turn when we chose to marry, the same slant of light through the trees. Away from you now, the old tastes and measures of a life alone mean nothing to me, as beneath my hands the hidden, deep-grained and polished heart of a man and woman's life together emerges like newly shaped wood to bridge away over this time away and keep us one. So, uh, thank you. Um, so that one had a happy ending. We, we just celebrated our 39th uh, anniversary. And, um, yay! And this is um, actually coming up uh, on the Equinox. And this is a, a poem um, for my daughter. It's kind of a forest poem. Uh, it's called, um, oh, it's in here. It's called Caitlin and the Bear. And she was pretty young at, uh, at this time, uh, hiking in the Barnes Flat above Lake Crescent. My daughter had nearly passed the tree by the time I noticed it. A mossy cedar with the buttressed swell of its base stripped clean to bright sapwood. Shreds of ripped bark and wood chips scattered over the trail like leaves. Caitlin, I called, who ate that? She stopped, and her gaze climbed to the claw-torn edge of bark higher than me, and she, somebody big. We felt the wiggly tracks of beetle larvae, powder-filled furrows in the orange wood, and the claw marks raked across them. Somebody, I said, must have been awfully hungry. And Caitlin, as if suddenly looking up at one across the dinner table, sang out, a bear. Then, just as quickly, where is it? Then, just as quickly, where is it? So we looked through ferns, out past the tall columns of trees behind us. He must have wandered off, I said, then catching her mother's quick glance added, a few weeks ago. <laughs> we should have known that later she would find him, a shadowy figure among the ferns that looked to us like a stump, but we all kept right on walking anyway, just in case. <laughs> um, well, and um, this, poem, this poem comes from a little while later. Uh, Caitlin got a little bit older, and uh, one of her chores was to bring out the compost after dinner, and it became fall, and it started getting darker earlier. It's called Wild Animals. Dinner over, just past dark, and my daughter refuses to carry out the compost. There's wild animals out there. <laughs> That's nonsense, I say, grabbing the pail and purposely leaving the flashlight behind. <laughs> past the porch light, total darkness. Then, just beside me, a deer startles and jumps noisily into the brush. A dozen steps later, heart still hammering. I lean to tip the pail and a low toothy snarl rises from darkness a foot away. 
I'm halfway back to the house, compost scattered before I realize, raccoon. <laughs> Christ, as the kitchen door slams behind me, there's wild animals out there. <laughs> <laughs> that remains, that rem I wrote a lot of poems for Kayla, that remains her favorite. Um, and we're all we're talking about family. This is, um, this, is, uh, this is called My Father Speaking, and um, my father was, uh, I, I say my father was an old guy, he was always an old guy. He was born in 1901, uh, he was a, a, a son of Irish immigrants. And um, where he grew up in the woods, where I grew up in the woods in Connecticut, um, uh, when he was a kid, there was the American chestnut. And it was, uh, you know, it's a legendary tree, and it was a really important food source, not only for wildlife, but for poor immigrant families as well. So, my father speaking, I, I, when I, I would go back and visit, uh, and uh, I had a little tape recorder, and I'd interview him. In those years, the aughts and early teens, it was woods from Mount Pleasant Street clear to West Peak. Eight of us kids then, Fran wasn't born yet, and I'll be honest, we were often hungry. We'd find food where we could. In fall, when the chestnuts were ripe, we'd comb McCarty's woods for them. We smaller kids would get a boost up on the lower limbs, but the big boys would find stout logs and give the trees a whack. Oh, brother, would those chestnuts come showering down. We'd fill gunny sacks, all we could carry, and haul them back to Ma, who'd roast them in the cook stove. The house would fill with their flavor, the nicest, sweetest nuts you ever ate. In 1917, the blight took them all. They never came back. When you were kids, I'd bring home bags of European chestnuts, remember? But nothing compared to those wild nuts from the woods. To tell the truth, I don't know what we'd have done without them. Um, and, uh, and here's another tree that's, uh, a little, uh, that's a little bit in trouble now, the um, white bark pines of the... Um, White Park Pines of the Cascades, Sierras, Northeastern Olympics, Rockies to a degree. It's a, it's a, a, a wonderful big spreading tree that grows uh, at timberline, tops of ridges. When I'm weighted down with the futility of trying to change anything, I seek the high ridges and good counsel of White Park Pines. Gnarled and wind blasted, they spread wide, long-limbed crowns and stiff tufts of needles expansively among the slender spires of mountain hemlock and subalpine fir. They welcome the full pitch of wind, needle blast of ice, slow broil of summer sun. They embrace their mountain world full on. At the highest reaches, even they are brought to their knees and storm-hobbled, crawl shrub-like along ridge crests, limbs unfurled in tattered banners against the cobalt sky. Every now and then, I need to see that. Along a ridge on the Cascades crest, I find a charred hulk of a lightning-struck pine. Its trunk shattered on talus, its broken-off base silver-brown, sun-baked amber, flecked with delicate furls of wolf lichen. But inside the charred hollow is the deep green of boxwood leaves, and beside them a single sprig of white bark scrabbling up through a rubble of ashes and duff. Um, uh, that's a, th thanks. That, that's a tree that's not too far off, um, off Hart's Pass over up out of the Medhow Valley. And uh, every number of years or so, I, I, I get out there, and I can remember where it is. And the last time, it's been a few years now, but the last time, it was still there. Um, so I wanted to read just a, um, I think maybe just a couple more. And, and once again, thank you for your patience and, and, and your attendance for, for this, uh, um, this incredible afternoon, evening of, 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 of poetry. Um, so this is, um, Kevin mentioned, was it Kevin mentioned Jerry Gorslein's cabin? Yes. I think it was, yeah, yeah. 
Um, well, Jerry was a, a dear friend and a, an important teacher, uh, uh, a botanist, um, uh, a forest ecologist, uh, a writer and editor. And um, he died uh, just a couple of years ago, um, March, January, or, or uh, yeah, uh, March in 21, 2021. So yeah, a little, little over two, two years ago. He was an important teacher for me. And our last outing, um, uh, with Jerry was my last outing with Jerry, my wife and I, and Jerry and his wife was on the Elwha River um, when the Chinook salmon were coming up after the dams had been taken out. So, it was, yeah, it was a nice it's a nice memory to be able to share that with him. A pall of smoke from western fires shrouds familiar peaks and ridges. But, cool, but a cool slipstream along the river freshens the air, and the late summer flow of the Elwha glimmers clear through the dark trees. There, like shadows over gray-blue river-bottom stones, a pair of Chinook salmon holds against the current. The female rolls on her side and at times, and kicks stones loosely over the nest. The larger male swims slowly behind her. Both are nearing their ends. Secure in river-washed cobble, hundreds to thousands of fertilized eggs breathe the clean, cold, oxygenated flow. Part of me comes here to breathe as well. Forests, brushlands, and towns burn to the south. This year of record fires, hurricanes rack the gulf, floodwaters churn over farmlands, and a pandemic flares again and again like an, like an angry curse. Here, a century of harm turned back. Dams came down. A watershed choked with concrete and steel breathes again. Salmon returned to a people and a river, and with them, a glimpse of a different way to be, a promise and a taste, clean and startling as snowmelt. Even as smoke thickens and obscures, for now, all but the nearest hills. So anyway, thank you. Thanks very much. And, uh, and thank you, Luther, for corralling us all here and, 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 and keep us, keeping us on schedule. And thank all of you for your support. Oh. Yes,